hello, Michael. Today we have a question that says, uh, it seems that there are many different words to call the, thing, the same things, like ego, I thought, mind. On the other hand, consciousness, awareness, I am, ourselves, Atma, Swarupa, Satchitananda, in which way using many different names uh, helps us to be more precise in our understanding. Shouldn't we stick to the same terminology? Is it important to understand the nuances between each one of these words? In the analogy of the 10th man, an old man tells the leader, you are the 10th man. And those words produce the clarity that he needed in the right context to find, to find out nobody was missing. He was the 10th man. Is the choice of different words in certain circumstances used to create uh, the right context for someone to have a realization? Um, the subject we are talking about is something we are talking we are not talking, this subject, this subject by Bhagavan, by Bhagavan teaching, are not about objective things. They're about that reality which underlies the subject, underlies the perceiver. That is what they're all pointing to. So, um, what Bhagavan is pointing at is something that is... Uh, that is beyond the, the grasp of uh, thought or words. So the words he uses are just pointers. That is all words. We use words to communicate with each other and we are, use it to communicate about things other than ourselves. Things other than ourselves means not only the physical objects and events of the world, we may also use words to communicate our feelings. We may say to someone, I love you or whatever, but even that love that we have for another person, that is something other than ourselves. Emotions, feelings, all these are anya, they're all other than ourselves. So the language is for describing phenomena, whether the gross phenomena of the world or subtle phenomena of, uh, of uh, mind and emotion and heart and so on. But what Bhagavan is uh, pointing at is be, lies beyond all these things, because these are all objects, even the thoughts and feelings and desires and likes and dislikes. These are all things other than ourselves. We who, who, who have these likes and dislikes and perceive all these things, we have a subject. Even this subject is not the reality. The reality Bhagavan is pointing at is what is the substance of this um, subject? That is, the subject is ego. Ego is aware of itself as I am this body. So it's a mixed awareness. It's mixing up the awareness I am with this form of a body. What is real in ego is only this awareness I am. So it, it, it is something that is too subtle to be uh, adequately expressed in words. So the words are pointers. Uh, generally, Bhagavan uses very simple words, but he uses them in a very um, meaningful uh, way. So we need to, when we first read Bhagavan's teachings, we will grasp something, we'll understand something. But as we go on and become more and more familiar with his, with his language, with how he uses words, we begin to see, and as we put it, most importantly, as we put it into practice, his words will begin to have uh, greater and greater depth of meaning. So uh, we, the same words are used for, uh, um, are used for, uh, to refer to the same thing, like ego and I thought, uh, that is, there's, there's no I thought other than ego, and there's no ego other than I thought. They are absolutely synonymous. The term mind, Bhagavan often uses the term mind to refer to ego or I thought. But mind is also used in a more general sense to refer to uh, the totality of all thoughts. Why Bhagavan uses the term mind to refer to ego is because if you take the mind to be the totality of all thoughts, which, what is the essence of the mind? That is, there are many thoughts. Which, is there any essential thought? Yes, there's one thought that is essential. That is the first thought I. Because 
all other thoughts exist only in the view of this first thought I. So this first thought I is the essence of the mind. Without the without ego, without the, this thought I, there cannot be any other thoughts because all other thoughts appear only in the view of ego. So ego is a thought, but it's a thought unlike any other thought because all other thoughts are jada. They have no awareness. They're not aware of their own existence. They're not aware of the existence of anything other than themselves. Whereas ego is aware of its own existence and it's aware of other things. So all these other thoughts and phenomena. So ego is a thought, but it's a thought unlike all other thoughts. Why is it all unlike all other thoughts? Because ego is, as Bhagavan often explained, it's nothing but that false awareness, I am this body. This false awareness, I am this body, is a mixed awareness. But the essence of this mixed awareness is the fundamental awareness, I am. That is, that is what is real. That is what we actually are. That is what shines throughout all three states. But whereas in sleep, we are aware just I am, in waking and dream, we're aware I am this body, and consequently, we're aware of other things. So um, now we, the, our awareness of ourself is mixed with adjuncts. The adjuncts, that is this body, all these five sheaths that constitute the body, these are all things other than ourself. They're all thoughts. So they are, so the mixed awareness, which is a mixture of awareness and thought, is a, as, as such it is a thought, but it's a thought endowed with awareness. So we 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 need to we need to read Bhagavan's teachings very very carefully. That is, he, Bhagavan uses language very simply, and he uses language also in a very consistent way. That is, though, for example, the term mind may have different meanings in different contexts, or even words like tan. Tan is a, a Tamil word that means oneself. He often uses this term oneself. In some context, he's referring to ourself as we actually are. Some context, he's referring to ourself as ego. In some context, we don't need to distinguish whether it's referring to uh, what we actually are or what we seem to be. It is ourself. That is, there's only one self. So we need to understand from the context the sense in which each word is being used. We need to. We need to see behind the word. We need to read between the lines or however, however you want to express it. The words are very, very useful, very powerful, very effective pointers. But uh, we, we need to see where they are. We, we shouldn't be looking just at the words. We need to see where the words are pointing. In other systems of philosophy, they're very particular term, terms should be very clearly defined because they are talking about objective things. When you're talking about objective things, when, when, if you and I are having a discussion about some, um, um, some objective things, like about political philosophy or moral philosophy or something like that, we have to be very clear what we mean. By when we use certain terms, because we're talking about objective things. So we, we need to be sure that we're both on the same page. But the, now we are talking about something that is subjective and also ultra subjective. I mean, it's beyond the subject. So um, the, in order to understand Bhagavan correctly, we need a very clear and subtle power of mind. We don't need to be like, there are many brilliant philosophers, mathematicians, people who will understand things you and I won't be able to understand at all. That is advanced mathematics or um, uh, um, quantum mechanics or um, even many, many forms of philosophy. They're probably way beyond the grasping power of people like us. But what we're able to grasp in Bhagavan's teachings, even these brilliant minds who are able to grasp so many complex things, they, they, won't, they, they won't be able to see the wood for the trees. That is, they, they will see only trees, they won't see the forest. Um, so um, uh, so it's, it's, what we need is not a mind that can process very complicated concepts and information. What we need is a mind that is very simple 
and able to see subtle things clearly, because this is an extremely subtle subject Bhagavan is talking about. So we need to have that, that, that subtlety. That's why Bhagavan uh, talks in, in verse 23, he, of he uses the term nun matial, by a subtle uh, intellect or subtle mind. And in verse 28, Kunda Matiya, by a, by a sharp, keen um, um, uh, intellectual mind. Kunda and Nun, they're very, very close in meaning. But the Bhagavan is indicating there to, to, go, to go deep in this subject, we need that, that subtlety and uh, acuteness of uh, perception, that is, he, he used the word there, mati, for mind or intellect. But intellect there is used not in the sense of, uh, that is, there are different levels of intellect. There's a the, there's the grosser level of reasoning and uh, um, thing, but there's subtler level of just being able to see, to be able to recognize the truth, to be able to distinguish one thing from another. Now, what we are trying to do, we're trying to distinguish this fundamental awareness I am, from this mixed awareness, I am this body. So we need a very keen and subtle power of, 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 uh, of, of discernment. So that subtle power of discernment we can cultivate by putting this Bhagavan's teachings into practice. And the more we cultivate it, the more clearly and deeply we'll be able to understand his words. So, Though Bhagavan's teachings are philosophy, they're philosophy of a very, very different uh, order of, uh, of subtlety than most other philosophies. Yeah, and I think that this, it, it, especially this, uh, the Chija Lagranti, this mixed awareness that you were talking about, that yeah. uh, ego that is something that doesn't exist uh, in absolute terms, but it has a real side to it, the only real thing. Yes. And it, it grasps a body as itself, but the body cannot exist, it cannot exist without ego. So it's it is something that way. So um, yes, yes. In in that uh, that's so why that's... we we need patience and we need we need to, we we need one thing we need to do. We need to be able to drop all our preconceived ideas. Sadhu often used to say, "If you if you." Uh, bring uh, a, a, in, in uh, I don't know if they still have, but, but in old days in India, children used to take a slate to school. It would be a, a slate with a little wooden border around it. And later they made it with a plastic border around it and with, with a little chalk. And they would use that for writing, learning their uh, alphabets and things. And um, so, uh, and slates are often used. Even Bhagavan sometimes used to write verses on slates, or more going to wrote verses on slates. Uh, Sadhuam also did. I often saw him, if he suddenly a verse came to his mind, he'd take the slate and he'd write it down. And later he'd come, would find some paper and pen and copy it down. Um, and with Murugana, often Murugana would just write on the slate and he'd leave it there until someone else copied it. So if no one copied it and some other verse came to his mind, he'd wipe out the first verse and, and write another verse. So Sadhuam said he always had to be vigilant. The first thing when he came to Murugan's room would he look for the slate and see whether he'd, what verses he'd written on them and quickly copy them before Murugan had wiped them out. So using that as an analogy, Sadhuam used to say, if you bring me a well-scribbled uh, slate and ask me to write the beautiful name of Ramana on it, First, I will wipe the slate clear, and then I'll write Bhagavan's name. If I, if, if I don't wipe the slate clear, if I overall the pre-existing scribbling, if I write the name Ramana, the name Ramana will be lost among the scribbling. It'll just be become another scribbling among all the other scribblings. You won't be able to distinguish it. Likewise, when we come to Bhagavan, we need to be ready to wipe the slate of our mind clear. We need to be ready to give up all our preconceived ideas. So those of us who come to Bhagavan without having read any philosophy, without even having studied Advaita, are very blessed. But those who studied all... Uh, the old texts of Advaita, they have so many, there's so much complication because in, in the, that is Advaita in its pure form as taught by Bhagavan 
is palatable to very few people. That is, Bhagavan said, this whole world is a dream. Most Advaitins won't be ready to agree with that. They'll say, no, no, no. Though it is sometimes Gaudapada and Shankara, they compare it to a dream, but they don't say it is a dream. They, they, that is, they, uh, they, they take it as an analogy. They don't take it, but it's actually literally this is just a dream. But according to Bhagavad, this is just a dream. There's no world other than your, in, in your perception of it. So because they have, because Advaita has to cater for people of, of less mature uh, or, or less mature uh, uh, less mature level of spiritual development and people who are still attached to the world they give an elaborate um, uh, uh, form of krama shristi or gradual creation how this element and that element combine together to form this and to how the five sen- how the sense organs were the sense, subtle senses and the gross senses and the, um, the subtle body and how many parts of the subtle body, 17 parts of the subtle body it consists of the, the five subtle senses of, uh, uh, sense, uh, that is organs of, uh, uh, sense organs, the five subtle organs of action and the five pranas and uh, the, the, the mind and the intellect and they, so much analysis and so much uh, um, unnecessary uh, ideas are brought in there. So if you've studied all that and you come to Bhagavan, you'll be seeing Bhagavan teaching through those already colored, through a pair of colored glasses, colored by the all the complicated philosophy you've read. So first you need to be ready to ditch all philosophy, including all Advaita philosophy. Forget everything you've learned and see Bhagavan's teachings afresh. Then you can. Then only you can see the. Um, you'll be able to grasp the, uh, the his teachings uh, clearly. If if your mind is still full of ideas that you've learned from other systems of philosophy or other, whether scientific beliefs or religious beliefs, whatever it may be. No, no. But what about the Big Bang? Didn't it all? Didn't it all start with the Big Bang? Hasn't science proved there's a big that it all started with the Big Bang? So how can you say it's all just a dream? So so long as you you're not ready to. It may have started with the Big Bang. Who knows? But we, we, the fact is we don't know whether any, whether it's a dream or not. That is, we've got there's no evidence. But what we experience now is anything other than a dream. If it's just a dream, um, it, it, to say it, it, any speculation about how it began as a big bang, in a dream is someone tells you the universe began with a big bang. Or if you see two people, argue, if you have an argument with someone, with two other people, one person saying the world began with a big bang, another person says, no, no, God created the world in seven days. And someone else says, no, 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 it was created by Brahma from his mind. His manas of putra and uh, creative a world. He uh, they, there's so many different in so many different religions, so many different explanations. And even in science, not if not all scientists agree that the Big Bang is the best explanation. There's uh, steady state, um, uh, the steady state theory, and so many other theories are there. So if you, you have a group of people all arguing about how the world came into existence in your dream. And if you also have your own view and you give your view, then when you wake up, <laughs> whose view are you going to agree with? The truth is it's all just a dream. So um, we, we need to have, to understand Bhagavan correctly, we need to be ready to set aside all our, all our preconceived ideas and beliefs and everything. We need to see Bhagavan's teachings with fresh eyes. Then only no because Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple. Why do people find it so difficult to grasp what Bhagavan has taught? Because we we are not we 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 are we are seeing it through colored glasses, so we're not able to grasp the the um, the pure whiteness of his teachings. If we come with yellow glasses, though he, his teachings are pure white, if we come with yellow glasses, we'll say no. They're yellow. So Bhagavan is confirming my my former ideas because what I believed previously, Bhagavan has confirmed that. I always believed that Japa was a way to attain self-realization. Bhagavan also said you can do Japa. 
So definitely Jap is a way to, a way to attain self-realization because you're coming with those colored glasses. And if someone else has uh, um, believed something else that you only by studying um, uh, and thinking about uh, uh, all the um, Advaita texts, but that's a way to attain self-realization. Yes, Bhagavan was also um, also talked about all these things. So yes, this is also a way. So we, we need to be ready to ditch all our, our, our old ideas and see Bhagavan's teachings with fresh, fresh eyes because he is, what Bhagavan has brought is something very, very, it, yes, it is a Dvaita philosophy, but it's presented in a very, in a very, uh, in a very new and very fresh and very simple and direct and deep, uh, deep way, Bhagavan has explained it, has uh, presented it. Yeah, and, and especially the word, uh, talking about words, the, the word ego is the one I think that has been most, uh, and it's, I mean, it's in some other uh, traditions or even modern contemporary teachings, like that it has been more distorted in a way in yeah that is more even, even in advaita even even people who studied traditional advaita they will understand a little bit about ego but how ego is absolutely central how there is no agnana other than ego that they they don't grasp and some of them even say ego is an object how yeah. can ego be the object ego is the subject so Bhagavan has refined and clarified so many things. And also uh, uh, take, to, to take the ego uh, as a psychological phenomena or a psychological yes, thing. Yes, 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 yes. I, I, have, I have an ego. Exactly. And ego <laughs> is like... That you got an eye, but has an <laughs> ego. <laughs> the, the eye that says, I have an ego, is itself the ego. So people, we need to clearly understand when Bhagavan talks about ego, he's talking about I. But I mixed with adjuncts, not I in its pure condition. That doesn't mean there are two eyes, one big eye and one small eye, or one uh, pure eye and one impure eye. There is only one eye. When that one eye is mixed with adjuncts and experiences I am this body, that is ego. Yeah, but I've seen, I haven't seen any other better explanation of Vigo uh, other than Bhagavan's because... No, in, no, Bhagavan is giving it... After I came to Bhagavan, after some other teachings and so on, it was never defined precisely or so uh, clearly stated that yeah. it was actually ego. Yeah, so Bhag Bhagavan, like, has, yeah. Bhagavan has clarified the nature of ego. Like what Bhagavan has revealed, for example, in verse 25 of Uludhunapadu, He's revealed it in so many other places, but he's sort of encapsulated it in verse 25. The nature of ego is to be always attending to things other than itself. And so long as it's attending to anything other than itself, it's thereby nourishing and sustaining itself. Grasping form, uh, uh, grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes, he said. So, but if it, instead of grasping form, if it tries to grasp itself, in, in other words, instead of attending to other things, it tries to attend to itself alone, it takes flight, it dissolves and disappears, it, it, it subsides and uh, dissolves back into its source. One that, thing, Michael, about that, that about hasn't that. been made so clear by anyone. So we uh, don't, yeah. we don't, we, we, that did the, this original question was about different words. It, different words may be used if we understand what is behind the word, Bhagavan's teachings are very, very clear and very simple. And why he uses different words in different contexts to refer to the same thing, that also, uh, will also be clear. And uh, that phrase that you, you mentioned, the uh, uh, ego takes flight. Yes. Uh, is that meant to only at the final stage when you... When you get no, to, uh, to be oh, each time, each time you go, you look yes. you within yourself. That, that is, is to be found. To 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 the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to that extent does ego subside and dissolve into its source. When we look at ourselves, when we turn the full 180 degrees, it is completely obliterated. Until then, if you turn 90 degrees, 
it, it, it uh, will it'll partially subside and partially dissolve. But I mean, we can see it when we actually practice. That is, if 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 some if some say some thought is disturbing you, some worry about um, some financial difficulties or some relationship difficulties or whatever. There, there are so many things that uh, preoccupy our mind, but occupy our mind at one time or another. At such moment when our mind is occupied with some other thought, oh, who is thinking this? To whom are all these uh, thoughts appearing? If we turn our attention back to ourselves, it's difficult to say it in words because if you, as soon as you put it in words, it sounds gross and it fails to capture it. But you could, it's almost like you can, um, you, you, you can see ego seems so substantial when we don't look at it. Right? We seem so, yes, I am Michael. It's so real. So long as I'm looking at other things, when I begin to look at myself, it, 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 immediately, it, it, we begin to see through this um, this pretense that I am Michael, I am Carlos, or whoever. I mean, whatever the name is, it 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 begins to lose its substantiality, its seeming substantiality and reality. It's true. It's, uh, uh... The, for example, going back to the Chija da Granti, if, uh, ego is a mixed awareness uh, 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 that consists of uh, cheat. Uh, 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 ego takes the the form of the body to yeah. be itself, so it's like a mixed awareness. So when you look within, there is awareness. You know why you are, you exist. Yes, yes, yes. 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 The, sensation, the sensation of the body is still there. Yes. But there is no link between the awareness yes. and the body that you don't see the link or the, the connection. Yes. That, so. is, that is, the more we attend to I am, the more we are, in a sense, separating ourselves from this body and mind and I mean, from the whole bundle of five sheets. It's still it's there. Like, uh, we're we, uh, we still connected to, to it, but in a yeah. subtle way, we are separating ourselves to the extent to which we attend to I am. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, ego is like like the yeah like the umbilical cord, like it's in, the, in between the the body yeah, yeah. and yeah yeah. It is the knot. It is the knot. No, the exactly the knot. Exactly the, yeah. the two the two are entangled. Yeah, exactly <laughs> entangled. It's all entangled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with it those, remains uh, entangled so long as we attend to other jada things. When we withdraw our attention from the Jada thing by trying to focus it on the chit aspect, then the knot begins to unravel. So I am is our I am is is the is our goal and I am is the path. Only by clinging to I am, that's the only way out of this mess we've got ourselves in. And it's true that uh, as you read more uh, more of Bhagavan's teachings, you mm, even though there are many some words, no, as it's uh, mentioned in the question yeah. to talk about consciousness or ego, uh, you come to see clearer each time yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, yeah. in this case, Bhagavan refers to uh, ego when we say we, but in this case, it's consciousness when we say we as yeah. uh, consciousness yeah. or something, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you see, if you see, for example, um, uh, um, I'll just take one verse as an example to show how Bhagavan uses language. In in verse um, verse twenty of Aludunapadu. Bhagavan uses the word tan. Tan means oneself. What he says here is the literal meaning is leaving oneself who sees, oneself seeing God is seeing a mental vision. Only one who sees oneself, the origin of oneself, is one who has seen God. Because the origin, oneself, going, oneself is not other than God. Here he's using the word oneself in some cases he's using it to 
um, to uh, refer to ego. In some cases, using it to refer to our real nature. For example, in the first sentence, leaving oneself who sees. Oneself who sees means ego. So leaving oneself who sees means not instead of attending to oneself, trying to see God, or even seeing God in name of all, is seeing a mental vision. Seeing God as something other than oneself is seeing only a mental vision. Then only one who sees oneself, the origin of oneself. There, one who sees oneself, there oneself means one's real nature. The origin of oneself means the origin of ego. So only one who sees one's real nature, the origin of oneself, is one who has seen God. Because the origin, uh, here he's using, there he was referring to uh, um, our real nature as the origin of ego. Here he's using uh, origin to refer to ego, because, because ego is the origin of everything else. Because the origin, oneself, meaning ego, going, that is when that, when the, when the, the when ego has gone, ego, which is the origin of everything else, um, that is our real nature is the origin of ego. Ego is in turn the origin of everything else. Uh, oneself going, oneself is not other than God. That is, we are not other than God only when ego has departed. So it's very, the, it's, the language here is deliberately subtle. Or, or see other verses. See, for example, what Bhagavan says in verse 17 and 18. Um, that is, Bhagavan's fundamental teaching is, I am not this body. But he starts, uh, and the world is unreal. But what he's, he seems to be saying the opposite in verses 17 and 18 of Uludunapadu. In verse 17, he says, for those who do not know themselves, and for those who have known themselves, the body is actually I. For those who do not know themselves, I is only to the extent of the body. That is, I is limited to the body for those who do not know themselves. For those who have known themselves within the body, oneself, I, shines without limit. Consider that that is the difference between them. So what does he mean here when he says, even Vinyani knows the body is I? Because in the view of Vinyani, I had, there's no limit to I. So whatever, if, if, there's, if there's such a thing as body, yes, it's certainly I. Whatever there is cannot be, cannot be outside of I, because I is without limit. I is infinite. Uh, so uh, it, it, it seems that Bhagavan is, is contradicting his own teaching here by saying that for Vinyani, the body is actually I. But what he actually means is something much deeper. But then does it mean that, that um, Vinyani is aware of the body? No, it doesn't mean that because he says, I shines without limit. Whatever is without limit is without form. All forms are limited. A, a form is a form because it's distinguishable from other forms. But that which is infinite is formless. So when he says, I shines without limit, I is formless. So he's not meaning, and in the view According to the principle he established in verse 4, if oneself is a form, the world and God would be likewise. If oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? We won't see any forms when we experience ourselves as formless. So what he means here is what others see as the body is what the jnani sees as I. That the jnani sees only I. He doesn't see any bodies. He doesn't see any forms at all. So Bhagavan's way of expressing it is very subtle. So why does he, is he just trying to confuse us? No, he's trying to, he's trying to lead us to go deeper, to view things in a more subtle way. That is what Bhagavan sees and what we see is exactly the same. The difference lies in, not in what he sees, but in what he sees it as. He sees he sees himself and he sees himself as himself, nothing else. We see ourselves and we see ourselves as all this. So instead of experiencing ourselves as one, we're experiencing ourselves as many. But it's the same self we're experiencing because there's nothing other than that. Likewise, yeah, in, 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 in that verse, for example, and uh, it, it is the verse 20 of love, the, the first one you mentioned. First one was verse 20. Now I 20. just read verse 17. 
in that verse, for example, if you there, there is many times the word uh, oneself. Yes. If, for example, oneself, if you substitute each time that he says uh, oneself, you substitute for ego when he, he refers to the ego or pure awareness, it wouldn't sound the same. No, it wouldn't it would sound be, the same. And it, it wouldn't it, sound the same. It would, it would be misleading, actually. Yeah, and also even more misleading, actually. Also, I mean, we when we explain the verse, we can explain here it means our real nature, here it means ego. But there's a reason why he's saying it like that, because he's emphasizing that it's all one self. That if they're not two selves, um, a real self and a uh, and a false self, there's only one self. It is it is uh, what we call ego is ourself, but a misperception of ourself, a false awareness of ourself. So, so it is not, it, ego is nothing other than our own real nature, but our own real nature seen as something other than what it actually is. So there's reason why Bhagavan, this is, this is an extremely subtle subject, and Bhagavan expresses it in an extremely subtle way, because he's trying to get us to think very deeply. So uh, since I talked about 17, I'll talk about 18 also, because in this, it's, a, it's a parallel verse. What he says in verse 18 is, for those who do not have knowledge, here it implies uh, knowledge of oneself, for those who do not have knowledge, and for those who have, the world is real. For those who do not know, reality is to the extent of the world. For those who have known, Reality pervades the void of form as the support for the world. So when the jnani says, this is the difference between them, consider. He says, he ends by saying, end, consider. Think deeply about this is the implication. Um, that is, for the, for the agnani, the world is just all these many different names and forms. That's what he means by reality is to the extent of the world. There's no, there's no reality beyond all these different names and forms that constitute the world. Whereas for those who have known, reality uh, pervades devoid of form. So what the Nyani knows is not all these names and forms. He only knows the underlying substratum. That is what we see as a snake. The jnani sees as a rope. So, so in effect, Bhagavan is saying here, for those who know and for those who don't know, uh, um, the, the snake is real. For those who do not know, the snake is real as a snake. For those who know, the snake is real as a rope. In other words, if you see the snake as a rope, what does it mean? All that is there is a rope. So if you see the snake as a rope, that means you're not seeing the snake at all. You're seeing only the rope. But the, the, fa the fact that uh, we mistake uh, a snake with a rope, uh, it means that at least we, know, uh, we know a little bit of our reality, of what we are. Because we always know. That, we are never. Ignored. I mean, we, we know Bhagavan, it because Bhagavan, that's what Bhagavan often but... emphasized. There is nothing new for us to know. We already know all that is to be known. All that is to be known is I am. There's nothing more than that to know. The trouble is we know more than that. That's a problem. <laughs> we have superimposed upon that fundamental awareness I am, awareness of all these names and forms. And the root of our, the awareness of all these names and forms is that which is aware of itself as I am this body. So Bhagavan's teachings are very simple, but at the same time, very deep and very subtle. It's not difficult to understand this, but we need to, we need to, uh, we need to uh, consider it deeply and understand what is behind the words. Not just take the word, we shouldn't just take the words at face value, because the words will mislead us if we take them at face value. What are they pointing to? Why does Bhagavan say for, for Vijnani the world is, is real? Because for Vijnani, reality alone exists. There's nothing other than reality. So if at all there's a world, yes, it's also real. That is what others see as the world, is what Vijnani sees as what is real, which is the formless 
uh, substratum of the world, the formless support, the, the basis. The, in other words, uh, we are seeing the, the necklaces and bangles and, um, and uh, rings. The jnani is seeing only gold. Mm -hmm. And it's true that, uh, yeah, to, to name awareness uh, as awareness or ego, meaning actually the same thing, ultimately, it could be, uh, it could be uh, mis misunderstood as being two different things, like yes. awareness is something else, and ego is something else, and oneself, sometimes it's ego, sometimes it's yes. called pure yeah. awareness. But when using the same word awareness, to refer to ego and to refer to our real nature. For example, in Ulusunath, the word, he, the word he generally uses for awareness in Tamil is Aribu. In Ulusunathu, in verse 7, he says the world and Aribu, the world and awareness, rise and uh, subside simultaneously. Uh, but it's only by uh, awareness that the world shines. What is the awareness that rises and subsides? It's only ego. It's, it's not, he's not there talking about the real awareness. But in other places, he's using it to mean the real awareness. So we need to understand from the context what he's referring to. In, in Nana, at the end of the second paragraph, he says, Arivainan, uh, Arivu alone is I, awareness alone is I. He uses exactly the same word in the first sentence of the next verse. The, if the mind which is the cause for all awareness and all action uh, subsides, the uh, perception of the world will cease. He's using the same word, Arivu, but he's using it in, in those two cases, he's using it different sense. Because in the first case, when he said, uh, uh, awareness alone is I, he then said the nature of that awareness is Satchitananda. So that's talking about awareness in its pure form. What he's talking about, when he said the mind is the cause for all awareness and activity, he means all awareness of things other than ourselves. So the same word he uses, but he uses it in a different sense. So that's why we have to read very, very keenly and deeply and perceptively to grasp what he's talking about. Why does he use the same word? Because there is only one awareness. But so long as awareness is aware of anything other than itself, it is ego. When awareness is aware of itself alone, that is its real nature. That is awareness as it actually is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Michael, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is very clarifying yeah. to have had this conversation. I don't know. For some people, it may be very confusing what we've been saying. It but... could be very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and to make things worse, uh, in yeah. many contemporary teachings, there are uh, more words added like Parabrahman or Turiyatita yes. or uh, yes, Witness. Yes, yes, yes. Many, many more things that yes. add to the, to the, yes. the confusion. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's true that he, uh, after all, Bhagavan's teachings are very simplified, even yes. though. Uh... Yes, 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 yes. <laughs>